Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Dave Kraus. I'm the Director of Veteran Services for StackUp. Uh, I want to thank you all for joining us. Uh, we have a, a great panel lined up for you folks and leading us in a presentation on battle-tested resilience strategies for the new normal is uh, Dr. Heidi Squire Craft from Psych Armor. She's got some really great information for everybody. Um, we're going to open up a little bit of a conversation afterwards to, to go over some questions and answers from the panelists. So I don't want to waste any, any time. Uh, Heidi, uh, ball is yours. Take it away. Thanks, Dave. I appreciate it. Hi, everyone. It is a very, very cool experience to be part of something like this. So I just want to thank everyone at Stack Up for inviting me to be here with you. Um, I am really pleased to be here with you to discuss some things that have kind of come to light recently as we've all been kind of dealing with this last couple of months and, and how things have changed so much. What we've kind of started to realize through this is that those of us who are military connected, who have served in the armed forces or our families, part of what we've been going through in the last three months is feeling a little familiar. And it kind of led us to start to think about the fact that maybe some of our military connected folks have some some words of wisdom for, um, for folks as they're going through this kind of bizarre and uncertain time. So we, we put together this idea of sort of some battle-tested strategies, some things that we know work. And I'm hoping to keep my part pretty short, turn it over to a couple of terrific veteran panelists to talk a little bit about what's worked for them. And then we hope to be able to open it up for you as well. So uh, without further ado, if you could go to the next slide, please. So like I said, uh, Heidi Kraft, I'm a clinical psychologist and a Navy veteran. I served for nine years in the Navy, including a deployment to Iraq in 2004 uh, during the first battle for Fallujah with a Marine Corps surgical company. Next slide, please. What you're seeing here is the, the front of our surgical company. It was Alpha Surgical. And I decided to put it up um, because the, the sort of inspiration behind bringing these strategies together actually really came for me from remembering that time back in 2004. It, it feels like yesterday and like someone else's lifetime ago, all at the same time as I remember my time in combat. And, and part of what we lived through during that time um, it feels eerily familiar, which kind of made me start to realize that that veterans and military connected people actually have some resilient strategies that we have always depended on. When things got really stressful, really unpredictable, we weren't really sure where they were going to be taking us. And that sounds like a lot about like what we've been going through lately. Next slide, please. So I'm here today from Psych Armor Institute. I'm the chief clinical officer there. And in co collaboration and partnership with StackUp, we wanted to, to maybe start this conversation and maybe just remind people a little bit about some of the things that we know work. Now, obviously, parts of our country have been hit really differently over these last three plus months. And we do have pieces of the country that have been fighting a different war um, than some of our other locations. We, the only thing we know for sure is that we don't know, right? What's going to happen with this whole situation with the virus? What, every time we think we know something, it changes. So we're very acutely aware of the uncertainty around us. But one thing I think has become really clear to me is that the people, Americans in general, and, and maybe military-connected people and their families and their support systems and those who care about them, we, we can sort of remind ourselves that we're the mission. You are the mission here. Some of you may be familiar if you served in what we used to call um, the PIES principle for treating people in combat if they were had experienced combat stress. So under great stress or in the face of trauma, we, we thought about a couple of things. We wanted to keep people close proximity. We wanted to treat them right away, immediacy. We wanted them to expect to get better. That was expectancy. And we wanted to keep things simple. 
That was simplicity. What I'm going to focus on here is expectancy because it turns out that expectancy is a big part of resilience. Next slide. Those of us who served, who made this choice to serve our countries, we've, we've run towards those people who need our help. We run towards challenges. Um, we do tend to be that kind of person. Um, so, so let's talk about that. What we expect from ourselves, from each other, in the face of all this, of the face of all this uncertainty, everyone expects that you, your family, your coworkers will continue to do your jobs, serve your mission, take care of each other with professionalism and pride. This is what, we're, what we base ourselves on, what we're very, very proud of. The bottom line, I think it's important to remember when things get a little uncertain that you do have the skills you need. And sometimes when things get stressful, it's just helpful to be reminded of some of those skills that you did learn and that you know. So we feel like this is familiar and this is our time. Next slide, please. So I have here a disaster response curve. Thankfully, really thankfully, things are seeming to be getting better across the country as we look at how this whole virus experience has, has sort of folded, unfolded. But there's a couple things to kind of realize here. There, there's two curves going on, as in my opinion. So we've got, sort of got the curve of the epidemiology, but we also have a curve of anxiety and kind of fear that has been moving through our country. And so we need to realize that despite what happens with the virus, we are going to have um, people who have lived in fear for a number of months and have lived with this uncertainty and unpredictability of what's going on. So just like we need to be able to expect to manage any crisis, we also need to expect to manage the aftermath of those crises well. Next slide. So, military connected people, first I'm talking to you. This is your time. You are used to being around tough, resilient people. And when you served, you were used to that. You may be still in great contact with a lot of those folks. Those of you that are still wearing the uniform, this is, this is what you're used to. Your families are used to that too. But it's also about sharing what you know. And so I'm hoping that for our broader audience, we actually have some things to share with them. When there's a threat, Military people depend on what they know, and they depend on their people, and they depend on each other. So we have some strategies that we know work, and now it seems to me that as the rest of the country also faces a stressful time, this is our time to share those strategies. Next slide. So we believe in my world, in the military mental health world, we believe that resilience is protective. And so if we can build some resilient strategies, we actually protect people when things get tough, when they get especially stressful. But we've always known that. Those of us who have served and our families, we've always known that. So what I tried to do in this presentation was, was grab a couple of few takeaways, kind of key things just to remind you of. Many of you will say, well, I already knew that. But when things get stressful, it's helpful to be reminded. I, I pulled together some things that will sound familiar. Operational stress control for those of us in the Navy. I think Keisha and I are going to go, woo -hoo. Um, <laughs> But others will say, boo. But, you know, we're all, of course, in love with each other at the end of the day. Um, we also have uh, stress first aid and psychological first aid. And I tried to pull just... What's the bottom line? What did we learn from this and what can we share from these? Next slide. So in operational stress control, the Navy has been doing this for a long, long time. And um, I know my Navy veterans have said, oh yeah, I remember OSC. They basically talk about principles of resilience. And what I'm gonna do as I kind of fold all these together is kind of highlight a couple of things. I'm gonna highlight the idea of controllability, which is controlling what we can. Highlight the, the idea of relationships, that social support and connection, and highlight the idea of meaning. You can see here on this slide the inverted U shape of that uh, graph. That graph is showing the stress performance curve that many of you may have seen before. But basically, 
performance does okay as stress gets worse up to a certain point. As stress continues and continues to get worse, performance starts to drop off. And that may be what some people are feeling after three months of this unpredictability, of this unknown, of this anxiety, of this fear. Some people may be starting to feel that. So this is where these principles of resilience might help strengthen them and protect them. Next slide. I'm going to focus on stress first aid a little bit. Uh, this is something that our military connected people are used to talking about. Um, there are, we call them seven C's of resilience, and I'm going to focus a little bit on the calm, connect, confidence, and competence, and how those things roll together into strategies that we can remember. Next slide. I'll also kind of fold into these larger strategies the idea of psychological first aid. This is a well-established method of taking care of people in the aftermath of trauma, and we do know that using these strategies right after a traumatic experience seems to protect people. We'll be focusing here on the strategies that promote hope and self-efficacy. Next slide. So what are military connected people trying to tell us about all this? We've got a lot going on right now. There's a lot swirling around us in our country between both the stress of the virus and all the recent sort of changes around us as people kind of mobilize and are, are working to kind of come together, there's a lot of stress around us and a lot of anxiety that still is kind of an ever moving target. So again, going back to our military experience and what worked for us. Next slide. The first of our groupings, and there are three, is this idea of controllability controlling what we can control. In doing so, this tends to give us confidence in our ability to get through difficult times. In the military, we're really good at this. We just train and we make contingencies. If A, then B, we totally understand this and we have no problem with it. But as we transition out, sometimes life isn't that straightforward. Things aren't those that black and white. So what we're attempting to try to harness here is a couple of key things. The concepts of optimism, gratitude, and humor seem to be connected in decades and decades of literature to resilient people. What makes people able to get through extremely traumatic and difficult situations like concentration camps, like prisoner of war experiences? What, what it seems to be the things that really bind them together? And it seems to be optimism, gratitude and humor. So we try to teach that as we teach people resilience in an attempt to, again, give them those protective strategies. Next slide. So I went ahead and focused on one thing because we have a very short amount of time. And I focused on gratitude. Gratitude practice seems to be now something that is so well established in my kind of literature, the mental health and stress and health literature. The data really supports it. Gratitude practice, and this can be just moments of your day, does seem to be a protective factor against stress-related conditions. And stress is a factor in almost every kind of medical condition you can imagine. Cultivating a practice of gratitude in your, um, in your life is something that we know can really change things for people. My patients will often tell me um, this, is, this is something that changes from one moment to the next. I feel so different after I do these very short practices. So next slide. What can you do? Cultivate this culture in your workplaces with the people that you care about, with your families. Cultivate a culture of gratitude. It can be as simple as if you're with a team Get together and huddle. That might be virtual right now. But once you're in person, get together and huddle. And go around that circle and have people rapid fire one thing you're grateful for. One thing you're grateful for. And you can't repeat what someone else does. You go around the circle um, very quickly. And I tell you what, take a look at the mood before you start that practice. And take a look at the mood after. Ask people what they think. Go around the circle twice. You'll see, you'll feel a difference, and people will say they do. It seems to change everything. 
For individuals, a couple of other ideas are things like a gratitude jar on your kitchen counter. Little slips of paper there, and every morning you write down one thing that you take for granted, but today you're grateful for. Or one thing that today you're especially, you feel great gratitude about. And you keep putting those things in the jar. And watch your jar fill up. And then at some point, take a handful of them out and read them to each other. Something like this really just changes your perspective. Another thing people say is take a gratitude walk. A lot of us have been walking lately. Um, so as you walk outside, just pay attention for two minutes. You set the, set the timer on your watch for two minutes and pay attention for two minutes to what you're seeing that it's a beautiful day, that, this, that the sky is blue, that the sun is shining on you, that there are birds singing, um, that there's not as much traffic, right? So you're sort of paying attention to small things that you can be grateful for in that moment. So just kind of throwing out some ideas here. When I have a small group, I actually go around that rapid fire, what are you grateful for exercise? And so I highly recommend it. Try it with your family. Um, try it with your coworkers if you have a small group and you can support that. I do think you'll see a difference. Next slide. The next grouping of things that we have sort of proven to be, be protective and help people kind of build up that reserve that protects them under stress include this idea of finding meaning in your work and in your life, which then promotes this idea of inner calm. This then can lead us to a feeling of being competent in what we're trying to achieve. Here we want people to focus on the difference that you're making. And this can be very simple, very simple little parts of your life. Focus on those small differences that you make and pay attention to little victories. Just stop and celebrate them. Pause to take a breath or two. This matters. We often are running and we don't stop and just focus for a moment on our breath. Some of us will need to consciously schedule your self-care into your day. We all have our calendars on our phones and we are very connected to them. Um, and what we need to do a lot of times, those of us that don't have as much time for self-care, which I know I'm speaking to most of you, we actually need to go in and put your self-care as a line item in your calendar. So whatever that is for you, whether self-care is journaling or yoga, or listening to music, or playing a video game that you especially love, right? Um, what that is for you, the self-care that will give you that break and that regeneration, schedule it in. Next slide. I focused on one particular practice that can be a self-care practice for folks because the literature is just very strong now around the idea of mindfulness practices and how mindfulness seems to change health and well-being for people, certainly their mental health as well. What do we mean when we say mindfulness? It's, it's an awareness. It's a turning of your awareness to thoughts, emotions, bodily sensations, what's around you, but all without judgment. This is just paying attention, not judging, not overthinking it, just paying attention. And just being curious about it, being willing to be there with it, even just briefly. So there are lots of ways people can find mindfulness in their lives. As I mentioned, the idea of that walk, that gratitude walk, that could certainly also be a few minutes of just really paying attention to where you are, what you see, what you smell, what you can touch, and really just being in that moment. Next slide. So we want to use these practices, which as I said, have decades of research around them. Um, we wanna use these practices to help people manage distress. So once again, here we are in a situation where things can feel stressful. So just reminding people of some of the things they've used in order to be able to bolster that resilience and reserve. So we know that mindfulness can do everything from helping people be physically healthier to reducing depression and anxiety to helping sleep. And mindfulness practices can be as small as one or two minutes at a time. So within your work groups, within your families, within your groups of friends, again, just a short huddle and the chance to just be quiet with your breath for about two minutes 
seems to reset for people. I thought I would take you through a two-minute, very brief mindfulness exercise. So those of you that feel comfortable closing your eyes, go ahead and close your eyes and just settle into a comfortable position. And just take one comfortable breath and be aware of how it feels for your breath to enter your lungs and be aware of how it feels for your breath to exhale. And as you take another breath, Pay attention to how your shoulders feel as you breathe in. And then pay attention to those same muscles in your shoulders and really just look at how they feel as you exhale. And then turn your attention inward to yourself. You are an incredible being. You have intense ability to learn, to change direction, to find joy, to overcome hardship, and to be in the moment with yourself. Just be for a moment with those feelings and, and say to yourself, for this, I am grateful. Next, turn your attention to the people in your life who support you. Maybe these are friends, partners, family members, co-workers, others, and just let your thoughts wander to them for a moment and think about how they do support you. And say to yourself, for this, I am grateful. And then return your focus to your breathing, taking one more breath. Filling up your lungs and being aware of how those lungs feel. Not judging. Just being there with it. And whenever you're ready, just allow your eyes to open. It was just about three minutes. And I hope that many of you feel a little different. Maybe a little calmer, a little more centered. You took a moment to be mindful and to slow down and give yourself that gift. The literature is very, very clear that even small amounts of mindfulness practice can make large differences in people's lives. Next slide. The third and final category that we know matter is relationships, social support, connection with other people. The data in my world in health psychology is so clear as to how very valuable social support is and how much it matters to people's physical and mental health. These can be families and friends, they can be colleagues, People who understand, for our military-connected folks, these may be fellow veterans or fellow active duty members or fellow family members, people who have been there, who get it, um, or people who are willing to go along on that journey. What we try to have people do here is just to realize how important it is to check in with people, especially when things get stressful, and to give each other that permission to check in, to allow someone to check in on you. There are lots of reasons that social support is protective, but one of the coolest reasons is that we seem to now know without a doubt that there's this hormone called oxytocin, which seems to be connected with 
us when we are with people that we feel that we feel like we're a group with, um, that we have those connections with, and this hormone gets released. It turns out that oxytocin is actually very protective in many ways. I have a cool little YouTube video here, and if you could play this and um, and then just move it up to nine minutes and thirty seconds and just let it play for one minute. This is a TED talk. Um, that I think you'll like. She kind of explains it better than I can. Okay. Thank you. Yep, just one minute. It's a natural anti-inflammatory. It also helps your blood vessels stay relaxed during stress. But my favorite effect on the body is actually on the heart. Your heart has receptors for this hormone. And oxytocin helps heart cells regenerate and heal from any stress-induced damage. This stress hormone strengthens your heart. And the cool thing is, is that all of these physical benefits of oxytocin are enhanced by social contact. You and let social me know when support. it's done. So when you reach okay. out to others under stress, either to seek support or to help someone else, you release more of this hormone. Your stress response becomes healthier, and you actually recover faster from stress. I find this amazing that your stress response has a built-in mechanism. For stress resilience, and that mechanism is human connection. I want to finish by telling you about one more study, and listen. All set. Okay, great. So. Basically, I, I show that just because she's she does such a great job in that TED Talk, um, and, and it's a wonderful TED Talk. I highly recommend it. Um, but I love that one minute where she just talks about how oxytocin becomes so much more powerful when we allow ourselves to connect with people. And it, it shows kind of maybe one of the reasons why our literature is so clear about how important social support is for people in bolstering their resilience and making them more able to manage stressful situations. So next slide. What can you do? Well, meet with people. Um, in an ideal world, we would try to have meet, weekly meetings, weekly team kind of check-ins, uh, if we possibly could, where we let people kind of vent and become inspired by each other, have a chance to kind of um, kind of regain that cultural humility, being able to take, take a moment to think about things from someone else's perspective, um, and maybe what that, what that person brings to the table and how important that is, especially in today's day and age. I think if we possibly can, in whatever manner you can, check in with each other. Next slide. Enhancing connection is what we in the military have always tried to do. Military connected people have always looked out for each other and they've always valued the team as, as very important. So this isn't a new concept. It is one that we, we tend to fall back on. When things get stressful, we go to the people that we know we can count on, and we always have. So again, expecting people to check in on you, knowing your people, knowing what baseline is for your people, for your friends, for your family members, and then knowing when to ask for help or refer if you're really concerned about someone. This is where it comes down to this idea of how important it is for us to just watch out for each other these days. Next slide. The bottom line here is that we're in a place here of mission reset and recovery. 
um, as we deal with kind of everything that's swirling around us right now, how unpredictable it is, how anxiety provoking it is. We have utilized these principles of resilience in the military connected world for a long, long time. We know them well. Um, but now we're in the middle of all this and you may know people who are exhausted or who feel very anxious, still have a lot of fear, still don't know where they fit in bigger situations and how they feel about it. So follow this military connected kind of principles of resilience that we went over. Just allow yourself a couple of minutes a day to remember them and to think about them. Discover gratitude. Think about it a little bit more. Give yourself a couple minutes a day. Ensure the people around you have a chance to decompress and to schedule time for their own self-care and then connect with people. The bottom line, we are able to do this. These are the things we can control. Next slide. Bottom line. It's okay if you're not okay. This is my line. I've said it forever. I say it to my patients. I'll say it to anyone who listens. It's okay if you're not okay. Um, we're expecting to be okay. But if you need a little more help or support, that's all right. Some of us do. And this is a scary, uncertain, bizarre time where a lot of things are changing and we're all just trying to figure it out. Um, so knowing what resources are available to you, knowing that anxiety curve and where you fit on it, and knowing each other. Don't wait until you're concerned about someone. Um, check in with them and just make sure to get them help if you feel like something is not right. Um, and it's okay if you need that additional support. Next slide. Psych Armor Institute has online training for people around a lot of things that are military connected and the best ways to kind of connect those people who have served and their families with those who want to support them. So certainly uh, check it out. They're all online courses. Some of them are very short, but they kind of focus on the idea of military culture being something that needs to connect us. Next slide. That is it for me. Like I said, tried to keep that short and sweet. I would love to now turn over our discussion to our panel members who are uh, members of Stack Up and military veterans. And I have a question for each of them. I'm going to go to them one at a time and ask them to introduce themselves. And then I've got a question for them that I hope they will be able to expand on what we have discussed. So first, uh, Dave Krause. Dave, would you mind introducing yourself to everyone? A pleasure. Uh, hi, everyone. Again, you know, as, as Heidi said, my name is Dave Krause. Uh, my role within you know, Stack Up is I'm the director of veteran services. So uh, I oversee see all of our direct support programs. Uh, my personal background, I was in the Marine Corps for 11 years uh, with you know the, the last handful of years serving as an explosive ordnance disposal tech. Uh, for those of you who are not aware of what EOD is, uh, we're essentially the bomb squad uh, for the military. And I had a great time, uh, you know, got injured uh, about seven years ago and ultimately retired from the, from the military in a medical retirement and found myself in the charity space. Uh, gamer my whole life. Uh, and I just, it, this was, uh, the perfect place for me to land after I transitioned out and it's just, uh, it's cool to be here today. Thanks, Dave. So Dave, I have a question for you. Please. After having, after having, uh, gone through what I sort of reviewed for everybody, can you think of an example in your Marine Corps experience or now during all this uncertainty when things felt out of control, and how did you take control of the part of the situation that you could? What kinds of coping strategies did you use to channel those feelings of self-efficacy or optimism during that time? Yeah, uh, so first off, and I feel like I need to put this disclaimer out here now, after listening to you for, for you know 25 minutes or so, and, and that was really awesome, and I, I'm rarely speechless, and I'm I'm having a hard time composing my own thoughts now because I was so enraptured oh, well, about what you. you were talking about. So uh, nice apologies in advance if I if I seem like I'm a little scatterbrained. Uh, honestly, I am a little bit now. Uh, that was <laughs> awesome. So uh, as far as my resiliency, um, you know, I've I've always I've always liked to to kind of look at myself like a like you know as a survivor, and it's always for me. I try to break things down to the lowest level. Um, you know, and you talked so much about uh, taking control of the things 
within your sphere of influence. Uh, and for me, that's always, you know, go, gone hand in hand with accepting, you know, the uncertainty of the things that I can't control, right? How do I, how can I get myself into a, into a place of being able to let go of those things while still maintaining control of the, of the things that I have the ability to put my hands on and, you know, have an impact on. Uh, so for me, uh, a lot of times uh, my, I've always kind of leaned back on, you know, what are my, what are my highest priorities for me? That's, you know, am I, you know, what's the status of my health? You know, am, am I healthy? Uh, is my family healthy and is my family provided for it? Do my, do my children have a roof over their head and food on the table? Uh, are my bills paid? If those things are taken care of for me, then that's usually enough to, to put me at ease and say, you know what, everything else, as long as I can keep those things in check, um, the other stuff is, is very secondary. Uh, beyond that is then it's, you know, do I have some creature comfort? You know, for me, that's, you know, video games or, or Netflix or whatever that is, uh, things that I can do to, to entertain myself. Um, but when something like, you know, this pandemic comes across and it, it's kind of a slap uh, across the face of everybody and you go, okay, how do I deal with this? And I think, um, you know, for me, especially being in, you know, the time that I spent in the military, you get so used to this very fast op tempo. And things move quick and you train and, and you get used to moving in this high speed environment where things are constantly shifting and, and maybe you're you're accustomed to being overwhelmed by a large quantity of projects or, or tasks that you're assigned to. And um, one of the things that I've really kind of had put in perspective for me recently is uh, and those of you may may notice behind me, I'm, I'm a drummer. Uh, I've been I've been playing drums for a long time. And one of the things that surprised me the most as I started to take my my musical development seriously was that I'd gotten so used to learning how to play things faster. And what I found was a real stumbling point for me as a musician was when the then the tempo gets slowed down. And I remember getting caught off guard and thinking, well, I can play this faster. Why am I stumbling now to play it at half speed? I'm playing half as many notes. Um, why am I having so much difficulty with this? And that really kind of hit me in the pandemic too, where I'd gotten so used to moving quickly. Um, and, and any all of the you know members of Stack Up can attest. You know, we're we're a small organization with a lot of projects, a lot of irons in the fire, and it was this real difficult uh, period of adjustment. Where I'd say, okay, well, we don't have eight million things going on anymore. We had all these plans that are now on hold, and how do we make the most out of the time we have it and, and still stay on top of the things that we can continue doing? Uh, and it was a little difficult for me. Um, and so, you know, it was. I felt like it was pretty easy at first. I had a lot of projects that were on the back burner. That I was like, great, now I have time to do these things. And then as soon as those things started getting done, I, I was sitting in front of my computer looking at a blank screen for hours and going, well, what do I, what do I do with my time now? <laughs> um, yep. And so for me, again, I, you know, being able to find some comfort in, you know, okay, my you know, my bare essentials are, are handled, right? We've got, you know, my bills are paid, my power's still on, my family's fed, everybody seems healthy. Okay, cool. That's handled. Now, how do I, now let me go down into, down the priority list here and see how's my work-life balance? How am I filling this time? Uh, and for me, a big part of that was, you know, as we had a lot of doors closing on some of our programs, I, I was encountering a lot of stress with that. And I said, well, it really, I had to take a moment and say, well, okay, these are the doors that are closing. Are there any doors that are opening right now that maybe I'm not seeing because I'm so focused on what I've lost? And mm -hmm. what we were able to find as an organization was that while our air assault program took a heavy hit, we, we just, we weren't doing events. Uh, it took me a little bit of time to, to realize something that should have been obvious from the beginning, which was, well, you know what, we've got this air assault program budget. Why don't we apply that budget to the supply crate program and double the amount of supply crates going out? Now we're still using that money to help veterans, but we're just doing it in a different, through a different avenue. And I feel like, you know, as a director of these programs, that's something that should have been obvious to me up front. And it, but it took me a little while to get to, and it really, I had to get, get out of the maze a little bit. And when you're down in the weeds uh, of things, you can get kind of lost in the maze and you have to take a breath like you talked about. Uh, give yourself a little bit of altitude to be able to look at the big picture and say, oh, you know what? Here's this other this other thing that I wasn't considering. Maybe we can explore that. Uh, right. So finding some some doors that were opening 
through this. Yeah. Um, some opportunities to speak and to get involved with our community in a way that I hadn't been able to before and to learn more about them and to give them an opportunity to learn more about me and some friendships that have developed through this because, well, you've got all this downtime now. How am I spending it? Yeah. And uh, like you, you talked about the importance of self-care and that was a big one for me. I literally got to a point where I was scheduling everything. It was like, all right, I'm going to yeah. get up. I had to structure. I had to be intentional about structuring my day, setting an alarm, knowing that, well, there's not a whole lot going on. I don't have to be up, but I'm going to get up anyways. I'm going to do emails for 30 minutes, and then I'm going to spend an hour playing Nintendo Switch because I'm worth it. And uh, it, it was the little things like that where it was just being able to get the little accomplishments in uh, yeah. starting early. And then, you know what? If, if I found myself in abundance of downtime, and, and I've had to tell some of the other staff members, I've had to speak to friends on this, it's like, I'm very much a keep myself busy person. That's how I avoid... Um, you know, getting stuck in my own head as I stay busy. Well, in situations where I can't stay busy, I've had to learn how to be okay with not being productive for a while and say, you know what? Okay, maybe I don't have a whole lot of work I can do right now. But why is why why should it be wrong for me to enjoy a day of hanging out on the couch watching TV with my kids? What's right. Wrong? It sounds like yeah. It sounds like you definitely have kind of come to a, a place of being able to. Um, reframe things so that they do become the things that you can control yeah thank you so much Dave. yeah thank yeah you. no i really appreciate that that was that was um you 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 touched on a lot of different pieces of control and a lot of different pieces of that self-efficacy chris i want to move on to you would you please introduce uh yourself to everyone for us uh certainly my name is chris coons i am in the army i'm have been in the army for 19 years. I'm about to retire and it's just, it, it's a daunting thought to be ending this phase of my life. But I spent my first 12 years as chemical operations. And then my last seven has been uh, spectrum management and that's who I am. Okay, awesome. Thank you, Chris. Congratulations on your in, your pending retirement. Chris, what are the self-care activities that work for you? I know Dave kind of talked about a couple, but how do you find a way to incorporate them in stressful situations, which clearly you've got a lot of experience with, with 19 years active duty, um, both in your active duty times as well as now during this pandemic and during some of the swirling stuff that, that feels stressful around you? So, you, as far as self-care um, practices, you need to make sure that you're taking care of yourself in a total mind concept. Body, spiritual, emotional, physical, um, mental. You need to... Uh, I've found that for me, going out, going for walks, going for bike rides, going to the gym, working out, will assist me in making sure that my, my physical aspect is taken care of. I'm getting the exercise I need. I'm ensuring that I'm working towards bettering myself in that aspect. And that helped me through deployments. That's helped me through the last 19 years, basically. As far as for the COVID situation, for a while we were on extreme lockdown. We weren't able to go out. We weren't able to go enjoy parks or go to gyms our gyms here just opened up for us so finding a way to continue that physical activity at home was extremely important to be able to not allow yourself to get into that rut and basically lose your mind because you can't do something you're so used to doing um with covid not being able to go visit friends not being able to have anybody but your family members in your in your home making sure that you reached out contacted your friends and family on a regular basis to keep that emotional connection alive and decrease the amount of loneliness you feel was also extremely important and that that's now that's for military members who are on deployment just making sure that you continually call, contact, email, whatever you can do to ensure that you are keeping your emotional state up to up to par. 
so for you, that connection, which is its own thing, is also self-care, it sounds like. You use it as one of the things in addition to exercise um, that, that you give yourself as a gift. Very much so. Yeah, and certainly on deployment, that any of us who have lived through deployments, we realize that sometimes that's tricky. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a uh, difficult sometimes to make that connection. Sometimes we have, we have uh, lots of different kinds of situations going on at home versus on deployment, and there's kind of a, a mismatch of information, but, and yet it's so important to continue to, to give yourself that gift and your family that gift. So, yeah, absolutely. Keisha, would you like to introduce yourself to everyone? Yes, hello, Heidi. Thank you. Um, everyone, my name is Keisha. Um, I am active duty Navy, joined as an officer in the Supply Corps community. I've only been in it for about five years strong, and I still have no intentions of getting out, so I'm happy to be here. Um, I've only been on one deployment so far, and that's on the USS Nimitz aircraft carrier CVN-68, and um, I'm currently now on my first short tour, and Ever since I started my short tour, I've been um, very happily doing what I can to volunteer um, currently as a crisis counselor and also as part of the Stack of Watch program. Excellent. Wonderful. I didn't realize you were active duty. That's great. Mm -hmm. Keisha, tell me about the support system that you depend on um, during your con military connected experiences, your, deploy your deployment on the Nimitz, now on short tour. How do you stay connected with people when you are deployed or now during all of this what's what are your strategies to keep those connections so um this part i think is like really uh ties in a lot with the third category that you're talking about with the um needing that social aspect that trust with the people around you and to be honest being on an aircraft carrier five thousand people and about a couple of hundred officers and like in a floating vessel in the middle of the ocean for a few months, you're in no short of people to depend on. And, you know, even with a couple hundred spaces, sometimes you just can't get away from any way at that point. And so during our deployment, we've been actually kind of fortunate as far as a support system, um, as long as you know where to look and what to look for. Um, for the officers, we had the uh, wardroom community and um, definitely whenever I walk around the mess decks as well, um, uh, there's usually people there hanging out whenever they're on, on watch. Um, and it's kind of funny that we're talking about video games here because during our deployment, a lot of the times um, I've seen people come together playing video games or even holding tournaments. So mm -hmm. I think that um, within the carrier community, we've been pretty fortunate. So I couldn't imagine what it's like being on anything smaller than a carrier. Um, with the change of schedule, it's been a little bit difficult to... Uh, follow up with uh, different groups around the carrier. I mean, like there's plenty of people that I never get an opportunity to meet, but at the same time, um, we are all under the same, um, I guess, knowing of the stress because we're all in the same watch rotation. We're all on the same, like, you know, constant shifts in schedule. And so I would like to say that the, um, as far as the support system goes, it's been easy for us to kind of lean on each other because we are aware and we're all in the same situation on the same boat as each other, um, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that matters to, to have just a couple of people that really understand what right. exactly you're going through. And, and I think in the military connected community, we stay connected many times with just a few people um, that, that even after we leave active duty, there's just a couple people that you don't even have to say anything. They just get what you, they, they know, they understand. So you're right. talking about your, your support community that actually really does get what that experience is like for you. Right, and uh, funnily enough, um, in using this compared to how things are during COVID, it's a little bit flip-flop, complete opposite. So now it is a matter of we are not really able to see people nearly as often as um, we had hoped, or like when I was on the uh, carrier, we're seeing people all the time. Like I said, you can't get away from them. But in a COVID situation, it's completely opposite in which sometimes we cannot see our family or friends when we normally would be able to otherwise. Mm -hmm. And so um, um, on another part of your question, uh, talking about how do we keep connected with friends and family during this, like let's say outside of the, um, the ship situation, mm -hmm. um, we've always had mail. So that's always been a, a, a pretty handy thing as well as um, whenever the uh, the the internet services provide, we also have been uh, relying heavily on, you know, just Facebook Messenger or FaceTime if we have capabilities to do so, or, you know, whenever we pull in ports, some people will go straight to the cafes, use the internet there. And um, 
one of the things that I thought was interesting and um, it's been pretty handy. I want to say that a couple of the difficulties that came with that is syncing up with the family at home when we have completely different time zones. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, imagine trying to uh, uh, connect with somebody when they are like anywhere between two and nine hours as uh, separate from you. But um, ultimately, knowing that everything is good at home, um, the family is safe, the family is happy, it kind of helps us. It, keeps the morale up on the ship end and we're able to kind of do our jobs a little bit better. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I'm sure you're, you're talking about similar situations that people feel now with the coronavirus kind of being feeling that isolated and having to depend on getting in touch via the internet or, or messenger or FaceTime. So yeah, it's many of many of these strategies feel probably familiar. Mm -hmm. Thank you all so much. I, I really appreciate just hearing additional people's thoughts on kind of expanding some of the ideas from my PowerPoint and taking that another couple steps further from some of our active duty folks and from Dave who got out a little while ago, but <laughs> um, certainly had probably some of the similar experience. We, we were probably in the same place, Dave. I wouldn't be surprised if we were. Um, yeah, I think I was, I don't know where you were at in Iraq. I was there in 2006, actually. So. Oh, well, no, we didn't cross over then. I was 04, but yeah, it may have been the same place, though. <laughs> entirely Maybe. possible <laughs> we um i guess we have about uh nine minutes right do we have the ability to take any questions for the panel or for me we do have one question coming in from cat cos nyc uh, someone asked for help how do you extend a compassionate hand do you help them do you guide them safely if someone asks for help um well yeah, how do you extend a compassionate hand how do you help them how do you guide them safely Okay, so uh, I guess from my perspective as a clinical psychologist, this is one of those questions, right? Um, what I what I always tell people is it's very very important if you are if you are concerned about someone or someone reaches out to you and asks for help, it is very important. It is crucial, critical to look straight at that person, and if you are worried, ask that person, are you thinking about harming yourself or killing yourself? Um, we need to know the answer to that question. We just do. Uh, it, we need to know. If the answer is yes, we stay with the person and we, we help that person get to the support and help that that person needs, uh, which could be emergency services or mental health um, intervention. If the answer is no, if, if we feel like the person is just needing some friendship or extra support or maybe some different levels of services, I think any one of us, you don't need to be a mental health professional, any one of us can be that person that someone can lean on, can just be that that ear, um, that place to vent, that place to, to just validate um, and understand. So sorry, my, my answer is kind of dual folded, but as, as a clinical psychologist, the first place I go is is making sure we've just had way too many suicides in our community, as all of you know. And um, I, that's my always my first priority is to make sure to get people to the emergency services they need. Uh, should they need them? And none of us should be afraid to do that. We can, every one of us can save a life. Um, and, and just that ability to connect with someone can be a lifesaver. Uh, me talk 6842 asks, how can I best support and address my Marines in need of help without feeling like I'm just telling them to go to the MFLC or chaplain? I feel like those are the only tools the command equip us leaders with. Mm. Well, I think I am going to uh, give my thoughts and then I'll also ask Dave. Um, so uh, Marines are, are every one of us, every one of our branches has a unique culture. And the, the Marines have a unique culture, having served with them a lot of my time in the Navy. Um, I know this firsthand. Um, my experience with Marines, they lead by example. So if you are a leader of Marines, being a person who is not afraid to ask for help and making sure that your Marines know that in your mind, in your eyes, it's okay if they ask you for help. Uh, is going to go an awfully long way. So one leader at a time, we can make this okay for people. And one leader at a time, we can take that extra moment and make a real difference for someone who might be struggling and might not want to seek those those resources. Sometimes peer-to-peer -peer is the best way to support someone. Um, Dave, Chris, Keisha, anything to add? 
Yeah, actually, you you did a really good job of hitting it on the head. Um, and that's that everything she said is absolutely correct. Um, if I was going to add to that, like my my personal experiences as a, as a leader of Marines, um, when I retired, I was a staff sergeant. Um, uh, I can look back on you know, one of the things that I often look back on, you know, from from my leadership experience is the the mistakes that I made along the way. And uh, I'm as guilty as anybody of looking back at some of those mistakes and be like, you know, geez, I, I really wish I'd have understood this back then. Uh, and one of the mistakes that I made as a, as a young corporal and still even as a young sergeant uh, was kind of, especially in the Marine Corps, right? We lead hard and it's it's firm. We, we keep a very firm hand on, uh, you know, on the chain of command. And sometimes that means leading with tough love on your Marines. Um, and that's a necessary part of military leadership. However, there is a time and a place to, to be human in front of the Marines under your charge. And definitely as a young NCO, um, you know, I was, I was so focused on being looked at as the leader that sometimes I forgot to act like a person too. And there were opportunities that I missed, uh, to connect with my Marines. Now, as I started to learn and see the mistake that I was making, uh, and I started to open up a little bit more with my Marines, uh, I very quickly found that I was able to, to have both. Um, you know, my Marines, especially once I was a sergeant, my subordinate NCOs, they knew that as a leader, when I was, when I was giving orders, when I was giving directives, they knew when to accept those directives, but they also knew that it was okay to come to me and say, hey, you know, Sergeant Krause, I'm having a can we talk for a few minutes? I'm like, yeah, come on, come into the office. And, you know, for a brief period of time, um, we're just going to talk like two people. And it, there were, I knew when it was appropriate to let down some of the military structure and say, hey, look, just talk to me, man. Like, what's going on? Are you all right right now? Or, hey, is one of your Marines struggling right now? What's going on? And then, uh, you know, being able to flip that switch. Uh, so Marines knew like, hey, when we're on the PT field and I'm telling you to run faster. You know that you have to run faster, but when we come back from that PT run, if there's something that you need to get off your chest that you feel comfortable coming to me and we can talk in private. Um, and I think that that's really important, um, you know, for military leaders uh, to understand any, any leadership position is there's a time and a place for authoritative style. And there's a time and a place to, to let your guard down a little bit and show them that you legitimately care about them. You got to be there. You got to care about them and they need to see it. Thank you. Uh, if, uh, yeah. Chris, uh, Keisha, any, anything to add to that? Well, I, I would say, like like Dave mentioned, you, you do have to humanize yourself to a degree for your uh, subordinates, your troops. But also understand that there are a plethora of outside resources for us. Uh, even while we're on active duty, we don't just have to go to the um, MFLC, chaplain, uh, your embedded behavioral health clinic you don't have to do that there are other resources such as the vet center military one source that will give you outside help if you if you're afraid that it might affect your career just as a leader you you need to start exploring those options so that that way you can give them a multi or a multitude of choices to make to be able to get what help you need thank you Keisha. anything to add uh, yes, so I second what uh, both Dave and Chris say. Um, it is important to, as a leader, be able to, um, as Dave said, lead by example. And then, as Chris said, being able to uh, be familiar with some external resources outside of the Navy. Because uh, sometimes that's what, and, or sorry, Navy military, <laughs> um, speaking <laughs> in Navy terms, um, sometimes it can be um, understandable when um, a person, if, uh, all right, let me backtrack a little bit. It's also helpful to be able to establish that kind of environment that allows people to feel open to approach you, um, you know, outside of um, the training, outside of the um, the work environment. And say, hey, sir, ma'am, um, is there a moment that I can talk with you offline um, about a certain situation? And as long as you're able to enforce that um, that environment that makes them feel comfortable to do so, then that is a I I think that's a great first step to start. Um, figure out the next steps to whether it is finding new resources or finding um, that chaplain to talk to, or if there's no chaplain in the area, just finding something to help out as long as they're able to first speak up about it. Absolutely. Thank you all so much. I think between all four of us, we were probably all saying very similar things, just a little bit different language, but but I think it, it does come down to kind of, you know, one person at a time, right? Um, making a difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah. By, by will being willing to listen. 
We're coming up on, on uh, 1600, as we say in the biz. Um, we still have questions or are we wrapping up? Okay, awesome. Um, gosh, Dave, Chris, Keisha, thank you so much. Um, it's really been an honor to be here with you guys. And, uh, and frankly, it like makes me miss the Navy. <laughs> I miss the Navy all the time, but, um, Every but day. this has been, this has been super cool. And, uh, I, 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 it's really been an honor. So, um, thanks to everyone who's out there listening and, um, and I'll look forward to if there's any, uh, correspondence that comes in, uh, later, if those that stack up, will pass it my way. Love to hear, hear any feedback you get or any, uh, further questions folks have. Um, thank you all so much. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm really, it was, it was great to be here and I felt like we had a cool conversation. So, um, it's been an honor. Go out and do good.